Recently, at Climate Solutions Live, we were joined by Dr. Morgan Phillips. Dr. Morgan Phillips is a co-director of the Glacier Trust, a UK-based charity that works in partnership with Nepali NGOs and academia to enable climate change adaptation in the Himalayas. I'd like to um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Morgan Phillips um, from the Glacier Trust. Uh, he's there, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can see it now. Um, Morgan, if you would like to introduce yourself, and um, you're very welcome to be here and tell us about the work that you're doing, and you know how we can how we can help you with that with a, with a platform like this. Brilliant. Thank you, Gary. And um, yeah, thanks so much for inviting me to join. It's um, it's really great to, to have a chance to have these conversations. Um, we're, um, we're a charity rather than a business. Um, so we're based in the UK and we um, enable climate change adaptation in Nepal, in, um, in the Himalaya mountains in Nepal, in, in the villages up there where climate change is having all sorts of different kind of impacts um, from glacier melt. Um, and the impact that has on, on water um, availability in the villages, but also um, temperatures rising, insect pest infestations, um, landslides, the kind of the way the monsoon season is changing. So they're getting drought and deluge of, of rains going on. So, um, so we're working kind of in that, in that space and we kind of talk about ourselves as a climate change adaptation charity, but really we're working on um, social justice issues, we're working on um, mitigation climate change as well, as well as improving um, biodiversity and so on in in um, in Nepal and in the mountain areas. So it's um it's it's always easy to just to just to stick to one kind of ex area of expertise, but really we're quite we're quite broad in what we do. Um, so I'm going to just share my screen. Um, hopefully you can see this. Um, let's start from the start. Okay. So this is, um, so yeah, so you can find out more about us at theglaciertrust.org and the Glacier Trust is our um, Twitter handle as well. So um, if you want to follow along about what we're doing, um, like I say, we're a, we're a small charity and work um, in partnership with NGOs in Nepal um, to enable climate change adaptation in communities like the one there on the, on the screen. That's the sort of environment we work in. So um, very small scale agricultural um, communities, um, lots of terraces where traditionally rice and maize and and militant things are grown, um, but increasingly working towards um, an agroforestry approach to adaptation, but also mitigation of climate change as well. So that's who we are. Um, I'm going to talk to you today mostly about um, a project that we've just started now called Great Adaptations, um, which is a kind of awareness raising campaign. Um, so it's, in terms of that, this is a great sort of, this is one of our first big opportunities to talk about what we're doing um, for, with the Great Adaptations project. Um, but it's also a book um, which we've just been crowdfunding for um, and comes out in September, um, September 14th in the UK, but I think it's available in quite a few other countries as well. Um, and we're also going to release um, a podcast series as well in, in October, November time. I'm talking to various people who work on adaptation from different sort of angles of it. Um, so that's coming up as well in October. And, and really we put this project together um, partly because it was locked down and we couldn't go to Nepal and we had a bit of time. Um, but really it's to try and get adaptation um, as a topic, as a kind of subtopic of climate change, um, further up the agenda and get more people thinking about it and talking about it, um, especially in the run-up to, to COP26. So what I want to do today is to talk to you about um, quite a few of the different sort of examples of adaptation that are happening around the world. Some of them are good, um, really positive ones. Um, some of them are quite ugly, quite bad ones, um, and some of them are great. And then I'll try and finish on, on the great stuff at the end um, and the more positive forms of adaptation and how it kind of intersects with, with other issues and other agendas around social justice and mitigation of climate change. So I'm gonna start um, here, which is um, Staten Island, not here as in, it's not where I am, I'm actually in, in West Wales at the moment, but um, on the map, um, in that red circle, that's Staten Island, which is just in the south of, of New York. Um, and I want to talk to you about what happened there in the aftermath of um, Superstorm Sandy that happened um, in October 2012. So 
I'm sure most of you remember what happened there. There was Hurricane Sandy kind of moved its way up the eastern seaboard of the US, um, causing all sorts of damage and then coalesced with several other tropical storms to create this massive superstorm, which absolutely kind of devastated the east coast of, of the states at the time. And Staten Island, despite being um, one of the wealthiest parts of New York, probably one of the wealthiest parts of the world, um, you know, wasn't spared from this damage. It was there was so much going, so much um, of the buildings were destroyed there. And actually, the whole Superstorm Sandy as as a whole, I think it destroyed something like six hundred fifty thousand buildings in the US and killed eighty seven people. So it was a, a really major event um, when it happened. And so in Staten Island, in the aftermath of it, after the clear up, um, the residents there, especially the ones living um, on the kind of beach resorts um, on that east coast, they started to um, think about um, what they would do um, rather um, what they would do kind of afterwards. You know, this is kind of a picture of the damage that was, that was caused there. Um, they had a kind of two options, really. They could either um, stay there and rebuild and hope to kind of build back better as, as we're as a kind of to coin a phrase that we use in the UK all too much. Um, they could either do that and try and kind of put up defences to, to sort of help them to rec to be more resilient to the next storm, or they could retreat and um, and go through a process of managed retreat where they actually kind of just migrate away from the coastal areas, kind of abandon them really, and, and to leave them behind. Um, and obviously, this is not an easy decision to make and not a cheap thing to do. And you know, Staten Island, compared to some other places which suffer these sorts of storms, has the luxury of having the wealth to be able to have those sorts of choices that they can actually retreat to. They have a have you know a government which which can um, find the resources to to enable that sort of thing to happen. Um, but having said that, they weren't sure what they wanted to do. So obviously, at the beginning, this when Superstorm Sandy hit, um, climate change was linked to it quite strongly, and um, you'd think that that would be. Um, the case, you know, for the case for building either either rebuilding and building back strongly and securely, or for retreating, climate change would be central to that, because it, it was unlikely to be, you know, it is unlikely to be a kind of once in a hundred years type event, which these sorts of events used to be. It's, as we know, with with the onset of the climate crisis, it's more likely these storms are going to happen. And there's going to be more sort of damage. So over. Well, the conversation was started that climate change was being cited quite often as, as a reason to to either retreat or to rebuild. And eventually they got to the point where retreat retreat became the, the kind of favoured option. Most people there wanted to do it, um, but they needed to convince the local um, authority, the sort of New York government, to actually um, help to pay for that to happen. They wanted they wanted buyouts. They wanted you know the, the state effectively to buy their homes and give, therefore give them the money to to retreat inland or to retreat somewhere safer up the coast. Um, but instead of putting climate change at the centre of that story and of that kind of case building, something really, really interesting happened. And actually, um, this researcher called Dr. Liz Kozlov, um, who's based in New York, she she went and spent time there to sort of analysing what was happening and the reasons and that how they were building the case for managed retreat. And what she found out was that um, climate change was actually kind of slipping down and people weren't talking about it as much. And she found there's kind of two main reasons for this. The first one is that Staten Island is quite politically, it's quite conservative. Um, it's kind of where Republican voters tend to live if, if they live in the in the US, in, in and around New York. Um, so it's quite conservative. So at that time, remember this is 2012, there was probably quite a lot of people there who were climate change deniers or at least skeptics or trying to play down how big, how, how important, you know, how, how major climate change was going to be. And for them to sort of try and make the case that they should retreat because of climate change, is kind of would be quite hard for them to do because you know they, they kind of identify as people who, who were more skeptical about, about climate change so they were kind of looking for another reason to justify the need to retreat and the reason they came up with was um kind of it's kind of quasi religious really they were talking about mother nature needing her land back that's kind of how they started to talk about it so um there's parts of staten island which are very low lying and um, have been reclaimed from the sea or, or on land where the sea would quite often inundate um, when, when there's high, high storms and so on. And so they, they kind of latched onto this Mother Nature wants a land back because it, me it meant they didn't have to talk about climate change. And then people who were kind of climate change believers kind of allowed this to happen as well because from a pragmatic sense they saw that, well, if we, we, we need 
a case to be built for the managed retreat that we need and so that we can get the funds to do it from the from the government will go along with this story and we'll also kind of not talk about climate change too much and so um sort of signs like this started to to pop up around around the neighborhood so they're asking for um governor kumo um andrew kumo who's who just become the mayor of new york and he still is um he's he started to get pressure on that mother nature wants to land back and he actually latched onto that story then so he'd, he'd initially started talking about climate change but then saw that oh there's an opportunity in this for me because if we talk about um, managed retreats in saturn island and um, being because mother nature wants to land back and not because of climate change it means that other communities in the new york area who'd also been devastated so you should see some of the images of what happened in new jersey and um, other parts of all across the eastern seaboard if these residents of Staten Island were given the funds to retreat based on the climate change threats of the future. That would mean that all these other communities all along the Eastern Seaboard would also be able to make the case that um, they should be able to retreat because of climate change, which obviously would cost the state a huge, huge amount of money. And so for Governor Cuomo, it was like, oh, maybe if I latch onto this Mother Nature wants a land back story narrative, then I, we can say, actually, no, it's not because of climate change that the retreat is happening and that we're giving the funding for this. It's because of it's because this, those houses should never have been built. It was a poor planning decision um, a few decades ago when we were kind of writing that wrong. So what was essentially happening is what's called agnostic adaptation. So people were adapting to, cl to climate change by retreating, but they weren't kind of admitting that it was because of climate change that they were doing that adaptation. So they were kind of deliberately being silent about climate change. Um, as being the reason for the adaptation they were doing, which was clearly was an adaptation to climate change. They were doing it for their own kind of self-interested ways to make sure they got the money to do the retreat. And I tell this story at the start of the book and I wanted to tell it today because um, it's kind of a metaphor for um, how the climate movement itself talks about um, adaptation or doesn't talk about adaptation. We're, we have been, especially in the environmental side of the climate movement, quite silent about it. There's a lot of focus, and rightly so, on mitigation. And I would never say that it's an either or. For, for me, adaptation and mitigation are very much the, the two sides of the same coin. Um, but the adaptation side of the story isn't really told very often. And so we end up um, kind of not acknowledging some of the adaptations that are happening around the world. We're not talking about them. And we know that they're happening because... And we know that they're going to go on happening because even if we are as, as successful as we want to be and limit warming to 1.5 degrees, things are still going to get worse before they get better. And people are going to be living with the impacts of climate change on a daily basis and they're going to be adapting to it. And some of them will adapt well, some of them will adapt in selfish ways, some of them will adapt in, in kind of um, mindful ways and in line with other um, agendas. So really want to raise these sorts of questions now are we acknowledging climate change adaptations that are happening around the world are we re are we reporting on them are we asking authorities to invest into projects that can enable the most vulnerable people to adapt um are we ensuring that the adaptations that are happening are happening in ways which don't cause all sorts of negative knock-on effects because we can as i'll show in some of the examples later on some adaptations um can just end up causing more environmental problems and more climate change you can pour a whole load of concrete um, to create a dam. And while you're building all that concrete, you're emitting loads of carbon emissions to do it. So there's, there's ways of adapting which are, which are, um, are just gonna cause more knock-on effects and kind of social injustices as well. Um, are we pointing out the precedent? So this is just asking that question of saying, you know, Staten Island has retreated because of climate change, not because mother nature wanted the land back. And if we're doing that as climate advocates, it means that other people who need to retreat will be able to make the case to their, governments and say look Staten Island retreated because of climate change we should retreat because of climate change um, and we need your support to do that before the storm hits not after it hits um, and it all comes to this question of ultimately are we staying quiet on on adaptation um, are, we, are we being um, sort of too too heavily focused on the mitigation side of climate change and maybe not giving enough attention to the adaptation side of it and what I feel is happening is that adaptation is gradually coming up the agenda and more and more people are talking about it and they're starting to see that it can be done in, in ways which are great and ways which aren't so great, um, ways that have knock-on effects and don't. Um, but this conversation needs to continue to happen because adaptation is only getting a small slice of the pie when it comes to climate finance. It's um, actually from the 100 billion, um, which was supposed to be promised to 
Global South nations um, as a result of the Paris Agreement. Um, only, well, only 80 billion has, has been forthcoming in 2020. And of that, of that 80 billion, only 1.6 billion is going to adaptation projects in the most vulnerable countries. So really hardly anything's been spent on it. And that's largely to do with um, the people who need the adaptation and need the funding for adaptations, their voices aren't being heard and, they, and the climate movement isn't standing up for them probably enough. Um, although that is changing and this is what we're trying to do with this Great Adaptations project is try and get this up on the agenda a bit more. So I'm going to do a quick sort of whistle stop through some adaptation stories I kind of came across as I was researching and writing the book. Um, this is just an image just to sort of visualize heat, heat waves that happen. Um, it, here in the UK, we're not so used to having heat waves, we're not as used as our sort of Southern European neighbors to having them. And what that end, what the result of that is that we end up kind of adapting in really kind of ad hoc ways and probably in quite some agnostic ways as well. We do, we're kind of adapting in ways where we don't even realize we're adapting to climate change. We just think it's a hot day. Um, so we're doing all sorts of crazy things like, um, Running out of um, running, running down the shop to get ourselves um, a desk fan to, to keep our offices cool and just kind of getting the cheapest one we can find. We're cranking up the air conditioning. We're um, kind of one of the things which happened to me once. Actually, on a, I was on a on a train journey on a during a heat wave and the air conditioning on the train had broken. So the kind of conductors kind of in that in the panic they just dished out a whole load of. Um, single use bottles of water and just we think all well, the plastic pollution that that created so there's all this kind of like ad hoc sort of instinctive reactionary kind of adaptations that go on um you know we have uk is not very good at sort of adapting to climate change this is just a picture of train lines that buckle so we you know we need to, there there's such strong adaptation needs here to sort of think you know do we need to have tracks that can cope with with um with the intense heat so they don't buckle you know, there's we're not we're not brilliantly adapted in this country yet and a huge amount of work needs to happen and we tend to just kind of rush out and do things like buy really cheap plastic handheld fans or my personal favorite is this which is a, a sun lounger for pets so that pets don't have to sit on the hot ground this i came across this photo and actually just an article in in the sun our um most infamous uh, tabloid newspaper so um this is the sort of thing people do they they kind of panic and they sort of just do these kind of really ad hoc adaptations and no doubt that sun lounger broke broke within a few months and ended up on a landfill site and caused more environmental damage so it's so if we're not talking about adaptation not thinking about it not being mindful about it not preparing for heat waves um in a more strategic way we end up just creating more problems and creating more environmental damage as we do it so there's the case for talking about adaptation is to help people kind of to say right there's a heat wave coming like don't just rush out and buy a handheld fan think more carefully about can you um have strategies around um restructuring your day maybe having a siesta in the afternoon if it's going to be a hot day things like that um then looking around the world a bit more this is a photo from um recently from canada and quite a few countries are doing this now during heat waves they're setting up um cool rooms essentially. I first heard about the ones in Paris during the Paris heat waves. And these are basically community centres or community run centres um, where people can, who, who maybe can't afford to have air conditioning at home or don't want to be sort of sat on their own kind of in a, in their air conditioning. They actually want to go somewhere central and kind of share one air conditioning unit amongst 10 people rather than having 10 of them blasting away in 10 separate homes. And so these are, these are being set up um, in, especially in countries which are more used to having heat waves. Um, to help people to stay cool and they're kind of similar to how um in in britain and i guess lots of other countries as well um one of the one of the reasons people went to um pubs to public houses um back in the day was because they were a shared um shared location to to, to get warmth and so people would go there to sit around the fire and tell stories and everything else but and obviously to drink but they you know it was some, somewhere they could go to, to stay warm um and these are kind of a similar thing. It's where people go to find cool. And this is something which is going to increase, increasingly happen. And this, and you know, if, if that air conditioning unit in that place can be run from renewable energy, um, if they have a good way of, if it's in a building which is well shaded, they might not even need the air conditioning and so on. So it's, these are the kind of adaptations that are happening. Um, lots of cities. Um, when I'm not in West Wales, I live, I live in London and there's more and more places popping up where there's kind of fountains in the street where people can go on really hot days to keep cool. 
Um, but there's some crazy things happening as well. This is a photo from Doha in, in Qatar, ahead of the World Cup, which is happening there in 2022. They're actually um, air conditioning the football stadiums, even though they're outdoor football stadiums. So they're putting fans in all through all through the stadiums to keep people cool while they're watching the football. And, you know, Qatar is obviously in the Middle East and these are going to be powered by fossil fuels. So this is an example of an adaptation, which is really kind of a maladaptation. So in the process of coping with climate change, they're creating more climate change. So seats, you can see just about um, the fans underneath the seats there. So every seat is going to be cooled if you're in that stadium, which is going to be quite surreal to be there. But I guess it's a way to make, to kind of adapt to the heat. Um, this is obviously quite a famous example, um, going to kind of the other extreme. Um, in mountain communities, um, this is just the generation of this is like a, a snow machine, which, you know, they started sort of making artificial snow in the 1950s in, in New York in the Grisindra Resort as the first place to do it. But it's happening obviously all over the world now to try and keep ski, ski stations open. Um, I found that in Italy, and this was a 2011 study, that um, 186 ski resorts have already closed in Italy because of a lack of snow. Which is, I just, I, I was staggered that there were there, there were that many ski resorts anyway in Italy, but for 186 of them to have closed already, and that's just Italy. I mean, not just because of climate change. Um, people, you know, their 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 hobbies change over time, but climate change is a big factor. But there's ski resorts all over the Alps and all over the Rockies and all around the world that are trying to kind of adapt to climate change, adapt to the heat, which is making skiing more difficult by spraying snow everywhere and obviously they need to generate loads of electricity to power those things which is creating more fossil fuels being born being burnt and more climate change as a result of it one of the most crazy examples of it though that which i came across was in luchon super bagnair which is in um, the french alps where they're actually using helicopters to fly up to the higher slopes above the ski resorts to collect snow to then drop it on the on the slopes below to keep those slopes going and it's a kind of a crazy example of how um, by doing these adaptations in a kind of incremental way, they actually kind of mask, they're actually kind of masking the effect of climate change because for the kind of sk the skier who's there, who's not really tuned into what's going on with climate change, they kind of think, oh, there's snow here. Great. They're not really thinking about where that snow has come from. And it kind of, if there wasn't snow there, they'd be thinking, well, climate change, this is an issue. But when, when the snow is kind of artificially put there, it helps to kind of mask the, the actual reality of what's going on. So it's kind of a form of climate denial in that sense, or kind of builds into sort of a denial of how big the problem actually is. And this is another example I found was in, in Moscow, in, in Russia, and in, in and around Red Square, when they have the New Year's celebrations, there's, they aren't getting the snow that they used to get. So they're actually doing artificial snow to kind of create a one, winter wonderland in Moscow to kind of keep that illusion going and again loads of energy being used to do it. Um, another kind of area which is interesting in agriculture and you know Gary and I have had conversations before about um, the effect of climate change on on agriculture in, in terms of coffee but um, wine is is quite a, an interesting one to look at so you know champagne is made in the Champagne region of France that's why it's called champagne and you can't call it champagne if you make it anywhere else so but it's becoming harder and harder to grow it there because because of the heat, because of the droughts that are being experienced in central France. And some of the big sort of champagne producing companies are now starting to migrate north and trying to find places where they can set up vineyards, um, for example, in the UK to grow sparkling wine in the UK because it's now warm enough to do it there. So they're, they're adapting to climate change by migrating and pushing north. But for vineyards that are smaller and... Um, you know, and, and not as wealthy and, and can't just sell their land and buy some new land. Actually, what's happening, which is really interesting, is that um, they're trying to make a decision on whether to keep keep going with the um, variety of grape that they're using in their location um, in spite of the in spite of climate change by kind of pumping in more water or, or whatever they need to do to kind of keep growing that type of eight, that, that type of grape. Or they're thinking, well, we can't grow this anymore in central France, but maybe we could grow a grape that grows in, in southern Portugal. And so what they're doing is they're ripping out their old vines uh, of the, the grapes that they've been growing for centuries. And they're actually starting to plant new vines um, with varieties of grape, which are more adapted to the heat. So they're kind of adapting in that way, which is, which is really interesting. And that's, you know, that's, that's wine, but that's happening with across agriculture and loads and loads of different crops that's happening. There's, 
the farmers are, are kind of needing to change the crop they're growing or the kind of the big agricultural companies are, are kind of abandoning land and moving moving to places where they can continue to grow the things they want to grow. Um, in Morocco, um, this is a fog catcher. It's um, it's basically a net which which they put on on the mountainside. And um, in Morocco, there's you know it's a, it's an arid area, very close to the Sahara. So in southern Morocco, um, water shortages are becoming more and more acute. And so what they what they're doing is they're erecting these fog catchers, which um, catch the mist which kind of comes up the mountain at the beginning of the day. It they, it kind of um, turns into droplets on those nets and then filters down into, into pipes and into guttering system, which then goes down to help irrigate the fields or to just provide drinking water. And it's, and it's enabling some, some villages to survive and to, and to um, not be abandoned. So there's, those got, there's another sort of adaptation, which I thought was really interesting is one we're looking at that we can potentially do in Nepal. And speaking of Nepal, um, I'll finish up by talking about what, um, what's being enabled there um, through the Glacier Trust and through the work we're doing with our partners over there um, to try and help these communities, not just to adapt to climate change, um, but also to develop um, economically, socially, culturally, and to kind of stay alive as communities um, in the face of multiple pressures, climate change being one of them. So we're, um, the thing we've had the most success with is the development of community-led agroforestry resource centers. So these are, um, you can think of them kind of like garden centers that we have in, in the UK and Europe. They're places where people can come to, to, to buy different crops and to learn about how to grow different crops um, back home on their kind of kitchen gardens or, or on their land if they're farmers. And so these, this agroforestry center was set up to try and help um, farmers in, in Dosa, which is in Solokumbu in kind of Everest region of Nepal, to um, start to start to do agroforestry, which is essentially the farming of trees. And what we um, have been working on with Eco Himal, who are our partners over there, is to help them to grow kind of higher value crops like, like coffee, but also lots of different nut crops, um, like macadamias and almonds, hazelnuts and so on. We're trialing all those um, different crops and seeing if they can grow in the mountains and helping farmers to um, gain the skills to be able to to be able to grow them and look after those crops um, but also enable them to kind of form into into cooperatives so they can um, get those crops to market and um, and also as much as we can we're trying to help them to um, process as much of the coffee if it's coffee um, locally so that more of the kind of value of the coffee is kept close to where it's grown which helps the communities to kind of develop economically and this is, we hope, a kind of early example of, of what's being um, dubbed transformative adaptation, which is where it's, it's not just kind of adapting to climate change um, and to try and keep existing kind of social, cultural, economic structures in place. It's actually part of a movement to actually transform the economic structures and transform society um, in a positive way in places like Nepal, which have been traditionally kind of asset stripped by the global north. So normally coffee in, grown in Nepal and countries like Nepal um, is exported as kind of raw bean and then roasted um, in Europe or in North America or in Australia. And the, the roasters then in those countries get, get all the money. And actually what we're trying to do there and, and hugely inspired by Not One Bean on this um, is to enable the farmers, but if not the farmers, at least the local roasteries in Nepal, in the capital cities, um, to roast the coffee there and then to sell the roasted coffee rather than the green bean because then more of the money stays in Nepal and it helps to challenge the the kind of um, inequality between global north and global south countries by helping more money to stay in Nepal and for and for it not to be kind of asset stripped um, through doing it and it's and it's proven to be really popular we've been really um, this this agrofor agroforestry resource center was set up um, in 2015 and We've since been able to open another one in, in another part of Nepal and in Kavre, which is closer to Kathmandu, and that's doing a similar thing, starting to help farmers to, to grow coffee and other higher value crops and to come together into a cooperative to, to be able to sell them in a kind of not-for-profit way um, with really strong um, gender equality um, principles around that and making sure that 
um, the governing boards have a have an equal split um, of genders, and that um, nobody's really kind of making a profit for themselves off it. This is very much sharing it out and helping the whole community to grow, so that more money can be invested into everything else that the community needs. So that into the schools, into the hospitals, into the into the roads and everything else, which will help that community to grow. So that's that's kind of the model that's that seems to be happening. We're not necessarily pushing it as the Glacier Trust, but we, we kind of agree with it and really love to see it happening and, and are doing what we can to make it happen, um, to fund those sorts of projects and to try and spread this community-led agroforestry resource centre model um, a bit further. This is just a picture of, you know, one of the kind of training events which goes on. So farmers will come from neighbouring villages all around the the resource centers to sort of learn on you know, this was a this was a coffee training how to grow organic coffee how to process it um and they, they all come together to, to learn those things um but they also learn things like how to make um pesticides out of um natural um cow dung and urine but also and plants to actually make organic pesticide rather than spreading more chemicals and they're doing similar things learning how to do um, organic fertilizers as well so really kind of having a really holistic view of, of development and not just thinking how can we adapt to climate change in a really self-interested way how can we do it which in ways which actually improve and enhance society and and the environment as well there's a nice picture of the coffee being uh, processed there so um yeah that was a bit of a whistle stop of it um yeah, you can find out more about what we do at theglaciertrust.org and there's all the information about the Great Adaptations book there, but I'm happy to answer any any more questions about um, the work we're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Phillips. Um, there is one question I wanted to, to touch on. Um, you know, you, you mentioned a number of times that you, you, you're working on a, you know, a small scale project and involving small communities, et cetera, et cetera. But when, when you talk about something like glacial melt, mm. how many people does, does something like that, you know, irregular glacial melt actually affect in, in, in Nepal area? Um, millions? There's, the Himalayas is kind of known as the third pole. It's one of the, one of the kind of way name, names it has because it's the third largest kind of um, mass of snow and ice in the world. And it is, you know, higher altitude areas are, uh, experiencing climate change more, you know, more quickly. It's like the temperature rises faster there. It's kind of two or three degrees of warming's already happened at those altitudes. And so the glaciers are melting. And the, the consequences of it are there's kind of two, two ways, I guess, in which it's affecting people. There's, the first is a kind of dramatic headline grabbing um, disasters that can happen. So as glaciers retreat so as, as they get smaller and smaller as they melt they form glacial lakes which form behind what's called a moraine which is a kind of mass of rock and mud and which is all full of full of ice um it's effect effectively a natural dam but over time as as the temperatures warm up that that moraine because it's it's kind of permafrost inside it that starts to thaw and starts to become weak and also the weight of water behind it means that eventually that's going to burst and when that bursts you get the glacial lake outburst flood and that can you know happen very very quickly a huge torrents of water comes down a valley destroying villages land farms etc so there's there's that effect and across nepal there's you know there's hundreds of these glacial lakes there's some which have you know, are only just forming that people have never been to. They're so remote and they don't know, have no idea how deep they are. There's actually one up the valley from that agroforestry resource center, which um, until about five years ago was just known as Lake 464. Now, now it's finally been named, but they don't know how deep it is. They don't know how stable the moraine is, but they do know that if it bursts, it could cause a huge amount of damage. So there's, there's that kind of side of it. And then more at a more macro level, the Himalayas and the water that comes down from it into the sort of major river systems and the, and the Hindu Kush as well. So right across that band of mountains, you know, there's the Brahmaputra, the Indus, the Ganges, the Mekong, the Yellow River. You know, it's it, that water, you know, billions, like two billion, three billion people are reliant on that water for agriculture, for drinking, for washing and everything else. So if, if we lose those glaciers, then that water is just not going to be there in the same volume and it will still rain up there but you won't have these storage storages of ice which 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 kind of let the water out gradually over the course of the year it will just kind of flood and go out and it'll disappear so there's 
so there's yeah, there's huge concerns. And Isimod, um, who are based in Kathmandu and Nepal, have done us doing lots of work looking at what's happening um, about you know how how dangerous it is. But because Nepal and the other countries in that region don't have huge finances, it's very difficult for them to work out you know which glacial lakes to kind of dam and kind of kind of um, manage the water flow from. So it's um yeah it's it's quite worrying <laughs> what could happen there and it's and obviously water is such a crucial thing and at, at the local level we do some projects to help farmers to you know capture water during the during the monsoon season by creating kind of small ponds and things like that and guttering systems and and so that they can maintain the water to use it all year round because they're finding that whereas the monsoon used to be really predictable and you could almost predict to the day when the rain would start again it's now not at all and so you know it can be two or three weeks late and so the end of the kind of winter as they wait for the summer can can mean there's you know it can crops can fail really quickly yeah that was sort of the point you know that you know we, we all talk about small scale um projects mitigation adaptation projects um but the consequences from from these these uh from these adaptation projects not being in place you know on something like 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 glacial meant that we're talking about two to three two to three billion people mm. Are, are, are you know unsure of any future um yeah but well, it's gonna yeah. it's gonna massively disrupt the water flow and obviously it won't happen overnight but it will you know the, the consequences are huge of um yeah absolutely so so why the book why the book why why the book um why, well why did you write the book i used to you know i used to be before i joined the glacier Trust, which is in 2015 i used to work kind of in the environmental movement and as head of eco schools was my first job of, before uh, moving to glacier trust and I didn't really know much about adaptation at that time and it wasn't something um, that crops up very much and it doesn't crop up very much in environmental circles and what I kind of realized through you know through visiting Nepal the, um, the times that I have is how desperate the need is for for adaptation because um, we talk about climate change and we're worried about the threats of it but as people actually been hit by it right now they're kind of you know they they've caught climate change already in the way that people have you know catch diseases and COVID and things like that they've and what are we doing to help those people and to and to support them to get through it and to be able to do it in ways which aren't just going to cause more problems in kind of in you know, negative knock on effects of it. So mm -hmm. I really just wanted to, um, you know, adaptation is a bit of a taboo topic in some some circles. People don't like to talk about it because they think that people will um, accuse them of giving up or saying that oh, climate change is not that bad a problem because, you know, we'll, we'll find ways to adapt to it. And, you know, I can certainly sympathise with that, but there's, you know, adaptations are going to happen and they are happening and they're going to, and more of us and more and more of us are adapting and we, and we will do um, as temperatures go up and then, you know, hopefully stabilise. Um, but there's, there's good ways to adapt and there's really terrible ways to adapt. There's kind of self-interested ways of adapting and there's, there's really kind of mindful ways of adapting. So, but unless we're talking to people about it, um, they're just going to adapt. They're either not going to adapt or they're not going to get the funding to adapt or they're going to kind of adapt in really ad hoc ways. They're going to just, you know, rush out and buy those plastic fans to keep themselves cool on a hot day or, um, or you know, cities are going to get away with, you know, using huge sort of concrete dam projects to hold back the sea rather than thinking about could we could we sort of reinstate mangroves as a way to, to help reduce the impacts of, of coastal storms and things like that. So just kind of really wanted to write it to get it um to, you know for my colleagues in the environmental movement to, to help them to sort of start to talk about this and start to investigate it a bit more and to think about you know we talk about transport and green ways of transporting around the world and you know we need to talk about green ways of adapting as well because it's just something we're all going to yeah, be doing absolutely, yeah. yeah that's right um does anybody else have any any questions for Dr. Phillips, I had a I had a uh, a little question that um, I because I was interested when you talked about climate adaptation that hides the effect of, of climate change. I thought that was really really interesting because it's uh, it's something that I haven't really thought about before. So do you do you have any like how have you found that we should do climate adaptation to avoid the risk that we kind of downplay the uh, <coughs> effects of climate change so to speak like how, yeah how should we avoid that 
Yeah, I mean, it's difficult because we obviously want to live as comfortable a life as possible and continue to do the things which, you know, make being a human a good thing. You know, nice. it's nice to be able to continue to ski if you enjoy if you enjoy skiing so you can sympathise with people doing it. Um, I think really um, the danger is with these kind of incremental approaches to adaptation, which kind of are just sort of adapting to like, oh, it's, it's got a bit warmer in the last five years, we'll, we'll, we'll get a snow machine in or th these sorts of things, is that we're we're not really preparing for the for the transformation of society that needs to happen like it's you know the scale of what needs to happen in terms of you know the deeper questions around do we continue to pursue um gdp growth as as an as a as a kind of central objective or do we actually need to think about lowering the amount of stuff that is done in the economy so that there's less material footprint so i think um i've been really drawn to the transformative adaptation movement which is a kind of a positive um spin-off i guess of the of the deep adaptation movement which i'm sure people have read about and heard about which which is quite um which isn't quite as positive but the transformative adaptation movement is really more about how do we um fold adaptation into a broader process of societal transformation to help to create kind of successive civilizations i guess which which are going to be more resilient to to um climate change as it happens but also um living in ways which are more ecological and more socially just and so it's that, that's the stuff which i've been really interested in and i think you know the more that um the adaptation strategies that are chosen are nature-based um and not reliant on fossil fuels the better really so there's you know in in the home for example um simply having um plants in your house can help to make the internal environment cooler um, so that you don't maybe need to put the air conditioning on quite as early as you would have done otherwise. Um, you know, good architecture can mean that buildings can be cooler um, during hot days. And some of that can be, you know, adapting existing architecture doesn't mean knocking buildings down and starting again, because there's, obviously that creates a huge footprint. But, you know, think windows can be shaded and so on to do that. Um, more advice around, you know, how to stay cool. Um, in Paris, they're doing things like um, opening the parks 24 hours so that people can, you know, if it's too hot at night rather than they, they can go for a walk in the evening time and sort of sleep during the day. Um, so there's there's lots of ways. I mean, it's just the more kind of, I guess, the more ecologically intelligent you are the, and understanding of, you know, what's what's a green way to adapt and what isn't a green way to adapt. You can apply those principles to your, to your adaptations, which means that you can adapt in, in you know, more mindful ways, really. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Um, I mean, we we you know I'm over in South America. I mean, I'm in Colombia, and, and we find that uh, the farmers here they actually want to carry out um, adaptation practices. They want to be involved with mitigation. Whether they have the resources to do that is 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 another question. But um, yeah, I think it is important to to be able to, to differentiate between adaptation for adaptation's sake and um, and things that really you know really work in the long term rather than um, adding to the problem. Yeah. Um, do we have any more questions for Dr. Phillips while we have him? Sounds like it's all gone quiet. Um, well, it's been a pleasure to, to speak to you again, Morgan. We, um, we have spoken a number of times on, on, on Twitter and on the phone. And, um, you know, I, I'm full of admiration for what you do. I really am. Um, we, we'd be happy to have you back to talk about the, uh, the progress you've made in Nepal, uh, or even the setbacks. But, um, you know, from, from my point of view, it's been an, an absolute eye opener. I'm sure that the book will live up to all expectations and, uh, we'll distribute a, a, a newsletter after this, uh, after this event where we'll, we'll, con we'll, we'll, uh, include the, the details of the book and the website and how we get in touch with you. But for, well, for me, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm. As I say, I'm full of admiration for the work that you do. Um, your enthusiasm is is absolutely infectious, and uh, keep up the good work. We'd be glad to have you back to uh, to discuss just how much of the good work you've achieved in the future. Thank you very thanks much. So, thanks so much for the opportunity. And yeah, it, um, yeah, we we're, we're looking to expand it, and we think the the agroforestry model is is proven to be popular in in Nepal. And we want you know every we're only doing it in three villages, and we want it to be happening in 
you know, 300 villages across. So, um, yeah, absolutely. And not just Nepal. I think it can work in countries like Colombia as well. So, um, yeah, it'd be great yeah, to keep, why not? keep chatting. Why not? I'll, I'll stay on for a little while, but I can't stay till the end, sorry. But um, thanks again for the opportunity. For, not at um, all, not at all. You're very welcome. And thanks for, you. thanks for spending the time with us this morning.